Our founding fathers believed in the work ethic. We trained Americans to not work. We tore at the work ethic. Just go sit in your mom and dad's basement and trade AMC and other meme stocks and just have a great time. Home Depot and Walmart, you can stay open. We're gonna put small business America completely out of business. The, the decisions that were made at the federal level were some of the worst in U.S. history. Danielle DiMartino Booth of QI Research joins me this week to talk about the economy, are we in a recession, and what's next for the stock market, all in this week's Global Macro Update. Danielle, it's awesome to see you. Thank you. We're fresh off of the Strategic Investment Conference where you you and Lacey Hunt were just so amazing. And I had, you know, we had, what, 20 minutes with you? And I had mm -hmm. about 45 minutes worth of questions. So I know. here we are. It's the second bite of the apple for me. And so much has happened, right? So much has happened since then uh, that, that I was not necessarily expecting and yet here we are. I mean, we have an actual Powell pivot in hand, um, which uh, you know, it, it required it required of Jerome Hayden Powell uh, kind of going off the reservation at the podium. I was really surprised. Was it in the moment that he just decided to make a change? I think it's definitely something that he had planned. Uh, you don't um, you don't effectively diss the powers that be at U.S. statistical agencies without planning, but there he was talking about Indeed, you know, and, and obviously with reference to Indeed's wage tracker and Indeed's job postings data. Uh, that was a slight to uh, to all those months that he clung tight to the JOLTS data. Uh, you know, he spoke to the conference board and, you know, jobs hard to get, jobs, uh, that metric being at the weakest since 2011. You know, if, if you feel like you're gonna lose it, it these this just just yeah, excuse me it came out in last week's most recent conference board um, report. But if somebody loses their job right now, their confidence in getting another one is at the lowest since 2011. But but the fact is Powell brought that up, so that was you know that's really dissing a lot of of all these revisions and revisions and revisions that we've gotten from the official uh, data bureaucrats. I was really surprised, and he. He actually also said, "Hey, I, I've been breaking the law too. By the way, since you, since we're since we're going to be chums here at the podium, you know, it's it is it is by law the Fed is supposed to cleave to both of its mandates, um, inflation and employment." And yet he said out loud, he said, "You know, for the last few years, for the last several years, were the words he used. We really have been focused on the inflation mandate, and." And he's been very explicit in saying, if, if we get inflation down, that's going to be for the best of the labor market in general. But he changed that completely. He said, now we're going to shift our focus back to jobs as well. So this is our sign that the Fed is engaged. They're actively discussing when the first rate cut's going to occur. What is it the change that you think triggered the, the pivot? And, and at what level does the Fed... I mean, we're still at 3.9% unemployment. It's incredibly low. Maybe we are. Maybe we're not. We don't know. And I think what triggered the pivot to answer your question is, is the, the, the benchmark revisions. And that does come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it cannot be ignored. We only received that, I want to say, the 24th of April, but... But I can tell you that there was there were plenty of presentations at the Federal Open Market Committee meeting about the annual benchmark revisions, because when you take something that for the quarter ended um, September the 30th, 2023, when you say, oh, there were upwards of a half million jobs created. Oh, sorry. Wait, make that negative one hundred and ninety two thousand. So a big, big, big swing. And it's not so much just that it's a large revision. It's a revision that says there were job losses occurring in the economy as as early as last July. Maybe Which makes sense. That applies to the entire quarter. Then maybe all that happened in September. If that's the case, it's even worse. That means that you had a sudden hard stop in the labor market that began last September, which is indeed, you know, that's the National Bureau of Economic Research. They're now on red alert 
this is when they start to decide when did recession begin. And was it September? Was it October? Um, something tells us that it was either September, August, October. We can talk about the McKelvey rule. Uh, and that's something else, hopefully, that, uh, you know, Powell's from time to time gets to see my research. So um, maybe he saw the work that we did on the McKelvey rule. I don't know. And that indicates that we are already in a recession. Is that is that correct? It does. Um, you know, it's, it's always been, been so intriguing to me that that the the mainstream media, financial media, so many economists pay attention to the SOM rule when Edward McKelvey, he's been around for longer. He was uh, uh, he was chief economist at Goldman Sachs. Uh, a gentleman by the name of William Dudley worked for him. Um, <laughs> another underling at the time, very young when I met him. Ed was not very young when I met him, but but Jan Hatzius was when he was a, a rookie economist working for Ed. Um, and Ed's rule is very simple, a 0.3 percentage point increase in the three-month moving average of the unemployment rate off of its last 12-month low. And that was triggered in October of 2023. And that's why I've maintained that the recession was going to be dated to October of 2023. You can go back to the recession of 1970, 1974, 80, 81, without fail. The McKelvey rule is flawless. It has a perfect track record in, in saying the economy is in recession. Uh, in the ugliest episodes, the 19, there was, there was a recession that started in November of 1973. There was a recession that started in July of 1981. These were really, I mean, the, the, the one that started in 1981 was a double dip. And that used to be called the Great Recession before the episode that started December 2007. In any event, in those two, the one that started in 73 and the one that started in 81, the McKelvey rule wasn't even triggered until three months into recession. So we could, we could have been in the soup as of last July. We don't know until we get subsequent revisions to all manner of data, whether it be retail sales or industrial production. There are seven different metrics that get in, uh, th that feed into the National Bureau of Economic Research's um, scorecard where they, how they determine uh, whether or not recession has begun and ended. That goes back to the Truman administration when the MBER began dating uh, recessions. But you know, by the same token, we know from state sales tax receipts, it, it came out for the state of Texas just a few days ago. That was really ugly. Um, but we know that state tax sales receipts have been down on a three-month annualized basis for months and months and months now, missing their projections. So it looks like, in the same sense that, that revisions tell us, have, have rewritten the history of non-farm payrolls, it looks like retail sales will also be revised, revised down. In, in months going forward. I mean, it all makes sense, right? We've all been kind of, those of us who watch this sort of thing have been mm -hmm. have been hearing the anecdotes and saying, why isn't it showing up in the numbers? And we hear about layoffs after not hearing about layoffs for forever, it seems like. You all mm -hmm. of a sudden start hearing about them mainly in Silicon Valley, but then it expanded and we had some trucking layoffs and, you know, and, and you sit there and say- We're, we're, we're not restructuring. We're closing thousands of stores. Um, across the nation. I'm sorry, but people work at all these stores. You know, when you hear something like a Route 21 is going to close hundreds of stores, that, that's a lot of people. D just today, Wendy's came out and said it's going to close, we're going to close, um, you know, 100 of our, our, of our lowest performing franchise locations. You know, that's what, what, 30 people if you're running two shifts times 100? I mean, the numbers start to add up. Let's take a quick break from today's interview so I can tell you about Malden Economics' new flagship investment letter called Macro Advantage. This is where my research team and I build a portfolio of ideas that are directly tied to the big themes and trends that you hear me and my guests talk about every week here. We identify the world's top investment themes, and then we build a portfolio around these themes all while explaining how they tie together and why we make every recommendation. While the research is thorough, we explain our ideas in plain English so you can sleep at night knowing why you're invested. You can learn more about Macro Advantage by going to www.macro.com. 
macro-advantage.com. That's macro-advantage.com. Thanks for your patience. Let's get back to the interview. It's not just the highly paid, say, Silicon Valley programmer anymore. Are you seeing the layoffs kind of spread out across the, the wage spectrum? And that's a really critical question to ask because this is when we start to see an acceleration. Because beginning in November 2022, that was when Amazon announced it was going to lay off its first 10,000 in its IT and headquarters ranks. Of course, those people all got six months severance, nine months severance, who knows, a, cush, a nice cushy package that, that carried them a long way. And that was certainly repeated. My goodness, uh, Google announced north of $2 billion in, in severance costs uh, for, for the year 2023. It's a lot of money that they're paying out to people who are no longer employed by them. But those days are over. Now we're seeing war notices uh, triggered you're seeing a lot more retail be affected. You're seeing a lot more truck, trucking companies, as you've mentioned. If they're lucky, they're getting 60 to 90 days of severance. And this, again, typically when you see uh, a labor market turn, it's very gradually, gradually, gradually. For the year 2007, the unemployment rate kind of bounced around 4 to 9, 4.9 to 5.1% or so. But once we kind of turn the corner to 2008, boom, there it goes. And that's kind of where we're in that at that point right now where we're about to see an acceleration in, in job losses that we see in the official data. Finally, you had a great chart that you showed at the Strategic Investment Conference showing the number of people who are working a second job to make mm -hmm. ends meet. And now on and top of is, a full time job. Exactly. On top of a full time job. And that's. That's what's so critical. Uh, it's that if 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 your spouse if your spouse loses their job, and their job is really specific, it's not something that can be transferred overnight to doing something else. Uh, my goodness, just to make ends meet, you've got your full time job, and then you're you're driving Uber at night. Um, you know, just taking on a second gig to do whatever you can. Uh, you know, in, in environments like this, we do see uh, disinflationary pressures also accelerate because there's no greater drag on inflation than job loss, right? It's it's one thing to say, hey, my paycheck is shrinking or I'm having to work a second job just to get by. But the absence of a paycheck, that is your biggest accelerant in terms of, of, of disinflationary pressures. But in the meantime, it still costs a lot to go to the grocery store. We have this kind of inflation hangover that weighs on, on, on households. You know, 14% of Americans on the, on, on the roads today have no, have no auto insurance. So 14%. what are the rest of us? 14%, 16% on top of that have inadequate automobile insurance were they to get in an accident to cover the cost of the car and the injuries. So uh, so the rest of us with our 22% year over year increase in auto insurance are subsidizing all of the, the drivers on the road that don't have it. But that doesn't mean that if you're going to live by the letter of the law, that it doesn't hurt. You know, my homeowner's deductible here in Texas more than doubled, more than doubled. Um, Recently, you're hearing about these absolute nightmares in the state of Florida with people's, uh, you know, homeowners insurance doubling, tripling, same with the property taxes. Um, and they're about to deal with, you know, condo Mageddon as of January 1st, 2025, when all these massive assessments are going to be, uh, added to their homeowners, um, uh, homeowners association dues. So, um, the essentials inflation is really, really, uh, it, it, it's a huge impediment for U.S. households at a time that unfortunately we've, we're finally seeing evidence that the labor market's turning. How do you see this playing out, right? Do, do you think stagflation is a risk? Do you think, based on what you said about, about employment, do you think inflation is going to keep coming down, just going to get pulled down essentially? I do see that as being the higher probability. Uh, I mean, stagflation is high unemployment. We're talking like double digit unemployment and, and sustained high inflation. And so people forget 
people forget the actual definition of stagflation. Stagflation is not unemployment beginning to rise and inflation staying too high for comfort. It's both of them increasing at a rapid pace. And I don't think we're going to go there. We, we, we're we getting more and more news of peace in the Middle East in different forms. And boy, the first big headline you, got, you, you, you saw, the demand part of the equation that pertains to oil prices immediately took over. And you saw this big air pocket fall out underneath West, Te- West Texas Intermediate and it slipped underneath the $80 mark. That's good news because we need prices at the pump to come down. But the, your other takeaway there is, you know, the rest of the world in recession. We cannot forget that the rest of the world in recession and and that's going to also be a drag on um on on global demand for commodities and that's exactly what we're seeing. The other thing that that you brought up during the conference with Lacey that really struck me is just is is the impact of interest expense mm-hmm. on not even the average household. One of the things that we get stuck on as we talk about averages um, mm-hmm. in, in the media, and then I like these deeper conversations because we can say, well, forget about the average. You know, there's there's like a group up here that can handle the higher cost, and then there's half the country that is really, really struggling. Can you talk a little bit more about, about what high interest rates have done to, to, to that lower half? It's a crying, dying shame that we had a rental eviction moratorium for 19 months on a federal level, to say nothing of states that extended it beyond that, um, and that people didn't have to pay their 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 mortgage for so many years in some cases, uh, that people had a, a time that they didn't have to make even their car payments, and these were by you know federal mandates. You know, please be kind. We're in a, we're in a pandemic, uh, and then the student loans, because. And that was nearly four years. But the upshot is that U.S. households lost touch. They lost touch with what a budget was during this period. And then you had inflation take off to the races after that third and highly unnecessary stimulus check was sent in the mail. Um, and then you just you had too much money chasing too few Gucci purses. Uh, and that really is what we saw. We saw t- so much of the, that stimulus money simply be wasted. Um, and But in the meantime, Americans kind of lost their ability to, to budget. And now what we're seeing on the backside of that is, uh, you know, the media loves to talk about people having the golden handcuffs of their two and three quarters percent 30-year fixed mortgage. And isn't that fine and dandy? But the flip side of it is, your American households for the first time are spending more to service their non-mortgage debt than they are to service their mortgage debt. I mean, we are living in a cray-cray world. Uh, and and people have have maxed out what they can spend on their credit cards with 22%, 21% interest rates being charged. Uh, you know, buy now, pay later was was not even factored in. Uh, buy companies extending buy now, pay later. They weren't looking holistically at somebody's credit. Um, Apple, I think, is, uh, was the first one to have changed that because now Apple is going to be reporting buy now, pay later to the credit rating agencies. But boy, that might be a little bit too late. Um, you know, too little, too late there. But, you know, but Americans are spending so much to service their debts. And those, those are just sunk costs. It's just, it's the same way the, com- the, the countries, now spending north of a trillion dollars to service its debts. Um, It's just, it's money that could otherwise have gone to so many other things like dilapidated falling down, you know, bridges. We forget what the New Deal did and how much good the New Deal did, but it was a public-private partnership. Certainly not this type of spending that we're seeing where you're forced to hire union workers and have ESG and DEI and all these other constraints and restraints that are assigned such that the, you know, the chair of of, of Taiwan Semiconductor comes out and says, this is the most wasteful public spending I've ever seen, and I'm on the receiving end of it. So there's... There we got we got that going for us, U.S. taxpayers. We. How would you think about comparing what was done during the days of the New Deal for for stimulus mm. to to what we just came out of? 
Oh, God. Were they on par with each other? Oh, no. One was 50% and one was 40% and one left a legacy and one left a whole different kind of legacy. One left a legacy of tangible things that we drive through, drive over, fly over, you know, used to, 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 to shore up water, waterways. Um, and the other left a legacy of really bad spending habits. So when you say 40%, you're saying, so, so in, the, in, the, in the New Deal, mm-hmm. the government basically spent 40% of GDP Over and we got the Hoover Dam. And we got the Hoover Dam and we got the right. Holland Tunnel. Um, you know, and those were, those were tangible. Those were, those were tangible things that we still have to this day. Um, and, and it came along with, with the, you know, dignity instilling power of work and, and how wonderful that makes us all feel about ourselves. So there were jobs that went with this and that we actually did the opposite. We trained Americans. And this is a bedrock. You know, our founding fathers believed in the work ethic. We trained Americans to not work. We, we tore at the work ethic in the United States by paying people $2,500 a month plus state unemployment benefits, plus not having to pay their rent, plus not having to pay for their health care, you know, plus not having to pay for their student loans. You know, just go sit in your mom and dad's basement and jump on and, and, and trade AMC and, and, and other meme stocks and just have a great time. And don't worry about all that work business. I mean, that's what this did. It left a legacy that, that, that harmed the U.S. work ethic. And, and the public has nothing to show, very, very, very little to show for it. What do you say to the people that would say, but Danielle, it, it was a pandemic, Right. There were people that that had no source of income. And and we know heading into the pandemic, we already knew that uh, the average household couldn't handle a five hundred dollar unexpected expense. Right. So so what what do you say to that argument and what should have been done? Of course, it was it was a pandemic. It was a global health emergency. And, you know, if and when you do do something uh, like close an economy and force people to stay at home, of course you provide them with some relief. Uh, but you certainly don't hand over the reins of the fate of a nation to teachers unions. When, when my middle schoolers left my house and walked down the street uh, within a matter of months and were back in, in the classroom. They were much further distance apart than they had been. Lunch was relocated from the cafeteria to the to the school gym to allow for greater social distancing and I'm happy to report that my middle schoolers are now fine high schoolers and there weren't they were not left behind and and to where they'll never educationally catch up you have rational policy but you do not extend and extend and extend um all of these incentives to not work well beyond when we had learned as a nation, if we needed to mask up, we masked up. We didn't, we certainly shouldn't have closed small businesses to the benefit of the biggest businesses. Okay, Home Depot and Walmart, you can stay open. We're going to put small business America completely out of business. The, the decisions that were made at the federal level were some of the worst in U.S. history and, and some of the most destructive given we, I like the backbone of, of my small businesses. We, we forced ourselves as a family to, to eat out more than we would have otherwise just to get takeout food from the local restaurants, just to try and combat some of the bad policy, uh, bad decisions that had been made. Yes, in the very beginning, you provide for the emergency relief, but you do not let You do not let parties with agendas take over and hijack policy afterwards. You keep your schools open for the sake of your children. You don't shut your country down here and there, and and, but not everywhere. It just, uh, uh, just uh, the worst questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, and look, there were people that got rich from it. (laughs) All the realtors of the world and the lawyers and people whose businesses never even skipped a beat, and yet they collected millions of dollars that rightfully wasn't theirs. The employee retention credit uh, and the fraud riddle program that it became uh, and and, and wealthy Americans taking advantage of that. Just the the amount of taxpayer waste and the amount of fraud that's taken place is just – it's just disgusting. So now we have this – this massive pile of government debt. We're either in or heading into a recession. Unemployment's going up. What do you predict? And and if you were if you're an investor, what what areas are you favoring? The latest CFO Duke University survey showed I, th- I want to say sixty six percent of CFOs of the largest companies. And then about 48 or 49 percent of all the other CFOs, smaller, uh, mid to small size companies had already used artificial intelligence to mitigate the expense of labor. Um, So I I, I do think that that whatever the energy that's required to keep those data centers going is going to be a win win, um, because I I do think that we're going to see a continued uh, a continued playing out of what I call AI chapter one. AI chapter one's the ugly chapter. AI chapter one is when you use AI to replace people. I think AI chapter two is when you use AI to completely maximize the productivity and output capacity of any individual employee. And that's when things really get better and co- and when it then it's applied to education and helping educate our children. So there's it's it's it will be a happy ending. It ain't going to be a happy beginning. Um but I do think that anything that is used to power AI is going to be one of your safer places uh to hide. Uh, maybe we can even retrofit some old malls and just fill them up with ways to power AI. Who knows? We need these big data centers, right? <laughs> we know small the modular are- reactors in your in your local mall. I love it. <laughs> well, um, well I'm, I'm just saying with all of these closings, you know, Express that's going to liquidate and the Journeys store. And I mentioned um, Route 20. So many of these, so many malls are just going to be uh, – uh, you know, and my advice to all my buddies in CRE is unless it's a trophy property, the value of the thing based on the land. And if you're not, if you're, if you're valuing based on anything but the land, you're overpaying. Um, that was unsolicited and, uh, and we can move on from here. But, uh, as far as investors go, um, know that the quicker the labor market data deteriorate, the closer we are to the stock market turning. Because stocks don't turn until after the Federal Reserve has begun to lower rates. So even though I can tell you that there were job losses potentially beginning in July of 2023 and that ergo, you know, we're in recession, uh, it doesn't matter. For the stock market's purposes, it does not matter until they see the whites of the Fed's eyes and they see the beginning of the rate cutting. And that's just, that's history. I can't. I can't go back and erase history, and I'm not going to suggest to you that it's different this time. Uh, but I will suggest that you're on borrowed time. So all those investors out there that are hoping for a rate cut, be, be careful what you wish for. Exactly. Absolutely. And and you better be darn to ensure that you're looking not at a company's bottom line, which can be manipulated, but the ability to maintain its top line and much more importantly, its cash flows such that its dividend is safe. So if you you can weather a, a storm for your long term holdings in the stock market as long as that dividend is safe, and so now is when to be up close and personal and familiar with with whatever stock you own with their ability to continue throwing off cash flows. Danielle, I want to make sure we talk about this because you you write uh, a daily note that has mm-hmm. been forwarded to me in, internally by John Malden. So I don't I hope of I don't course, get him in I'll, trouble. I'll, I'll <laughs> Yes, yes. It's called The Daily Feather. Tell me a little bit about it because your work is it, – it's so good and it's so important. I want people to, to make sure they know how to find you. It's with good reason that I like to say that QI Research is the anti-sell side. We are, we are everything that you will never read on the sell side. Uh, it's, it's, it's never boring. We don't really linger on headlines – uh, anything that you're going to read on the front page, we really want to tell you about leading indicators because 
you know, it's that old Wayne Gretzky, you know, you want to know where the puck is going. That's all we want to know as a research firm. We just want to know where the economy is headed. We want to be the first to come out of the gate and say, we're headed into an expansion. This recession's almost over. That's where we want to be. And we, we find that out by going deeper, by peeling back that proverbial um, onion to see where some of the indexes are telling us we're headed. We saw something pretty extraordinary. We saw uh, the S&P Global and the ISM services uh, employment indices both turn deeply negative in, uh, in the month of April. This does not occur outside recession. Uh, but those are the types of things we look at. We want to see when, when there's synchronous moves across different subsets and different surveys, uh, so that we can look for trends and patterns. Just like when you've got a, a kid or a grandkid and you're like, do you detect a pattern? We're looking for the patterns. Uh, and that's what we do every single day, every single trading day of the year with the daily feather. We take great pride in it. Yeah, it really is excellent. I'm, I'm going to have a, a link to where viewers can can access it. And just so everybody knows, this is not an affiliate arrangement. I don't get anything for this. I just, I think your work is so good. I really want to make sure as many people as possible check it out. Danielle DiMartino Booth, it's so much fun talking to you. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. And thank you for yours. What a great conversation. Thank you. Before you leave, I want to invite you to join my Global Macro Update newsletter. This is a free service that comes out every Tuesday and Friday. I'll send you an email with my latest thoughts on geopolitics, economics, the markets, along with a link to the latest interview and a transcript. If you'd like to join us, hit the link in the description below or go to globalmacroupdate.com and join over 100,000 other Global Macro Update readers. I hope you join us. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for watching.